Hi everybody, welcome back. And today's lecture, uh, we're gonna talk about contracts again. I know you guys are all excited. You're like, woohoo, contracts, yeah. All right then, okay, maybe you're not that excited about it, but this is the second um, video in this series. The first one was contract formation. This one is about contracts, um, defenses, non-parties, and how to interpret a contract. Um, we discussed in the prior video, the one called contract formation, that in order to uh, form a valid contract, you needed three things. Remember, the first thing that we needed was mutual assent of the parties. The second thing that we needed was consideration. And then the third thing we needed was the absence of defenses. That means if you have to have a valid contract, you can't have a defense floating around out there that one of the parties can say, judge, you can't enforce this because I have a defense. If something like that is floating around in the contract sphere, <laughs> um, then you know that causes a problem, that causes an issue. So whenever you write your contracts, you want to make sure that you don't have uh, they haven't created a defense unnecessarily. So let's talk about what things can happen while you're forming the contract that would make it um, defensible to someone, that would make it unenforceable by the court. So, of course, to be enforceable, a contract has to be free of these legally recognized as defenses, um, and it would prevent enforcement. So first we're going to start out with lack of capacity. This is the first defense. You want to make sure that when both parties, let's say there's two parties, that they're entering into a contract, that they are of the age of majority, which is 18 years old, that they have the mental capacity, in other words, have they been declared incompetent by the court, do they have Alzheimer's, do they have dementia, um, is there some other reason, something physical or mentally that is preventing them from having the capacity to sign documentation, um, or are they intoxicated? I mean, are you dealing with a person who's drunk or high? Um, if someone's stoned, they really should not be signing a contract. Um, so when you have these, you have to look out for these things. If you have any of these three things, then you're going to have a contract. It's going to be a valid contract, but it's going to be voidable, which means the incapacitated person, whether they were a minor or they were mentally incapacitated or they were intoxicated, during the formation of the contract, at the time of the formation, they can say to a judge, Your Honor, you can't make me do what I said I was going to do under this contract because I was, you know, fill in the blank. I was drunk. I was a minor. This makes this contract voidable, and that is at the option of the incapacitated person. So, not a very good contract to enter it into if you are not the incapacitated person. Okay, what's another defense that somebody could bring up to say that your contract is not valid? All right, lack of consent. You can say, you know what, I didn't agree to that. Well, your name is on the contract, you signed it, is that your signature? Well, yeah, that's my signature, but I didn't consent to it. Why didn't you consent to it? Well, there are four main categories of lack of consent. The first one is duress. Imagine somebody holding a gun to your head and saying, if you don't sign this, I'm going to shoot you, or I'm going to shoot your family, or I'm going to shoot that dog, or, you know, whatever. I'm going to, you name it, I'm going to shoot it. You feel compelled to sign because you, you know, you don't believe in this contract, but you also don't want to be responsible for the death of other people, and you certainly don't want to get shot yourself. So that is signing something under pressure, under coercion, under duress. Undue influence means you've pretty much been convinced to do this by somebody who wields uh, a special relationship over you, your pastor. Go ahead, sign your, your house over to the church. Come on, it'll be okay. Um, and maybe you really don't want to do it, and something inside of you is saying, you know what, I don't want to sign uh, my house over to this this pastor. I mean, I, I love the church, but boy, I really don't want to sign my house over, but I better do it because everybody's going to look at me really funny if I don't. That's not really consent, is it? You're not 100% behind this. You could later argue um, that it was signed um, because of undue influence of someone. Misrepresentation and fraud are very similar. Misrepresentation is where the facts, uh, the content, something material in that contract was misrepresented to you, and you thought that you were consenting to something else, but after you signed the contract, you learned that, hey, wait a minute, 
this isn't what I thought it was going to be. Sometimes misrepresentation is innocent, it's done by accident, and other times it's committed on purpose and that's going to be fraud. What's another defense that you could have to having a contract be enforced against you? Um, well, you could have entered into the contract by mistake. What does that mean? <laughs> I mean, you signed the contract. It's not like you, you tripped and fell over something and automatically signed that piece of paper that was on the floor. Um, that's not what we're talking about here when we talk about mistake. This is mistake of something material, something important in that contract. Let's talk about a cow, okay? Let's say I'm selling a cow and you want to use the cow for breeding purposes. So you ask me, is your cow fertile? And I say, absolutely. We call her Fertile Myrtle. She is the most fertile cow that you will ever meet. And to me, I think the cow is fertile. I've had a vet check the cow. Cow seemed like she was, she was ready to go. Um, and, you know, so I'm going to sell you this cow for $25,000 because you're going to use her for breeding purposes and she's a, a prize show cow. Well, you think she's fertile. We all do. You buy her. Guess what? Both of us were wrong. You believed me and I believed me. Um, but maybe it turns out she was in fact sterile. That maybe the vet was wrong, the report was wrong, the vet made a mistake, something happened. In that case, we could go to court and this, we could sort of say, hey, this contract was based on a mutual mistake. A unilateral mistake where one party's wrong, okay? Um, I, how about I know, um, uh, or I don't know that my cow is fertile. I think I'm selling you a sterile cow, but you know, you know, because you're a veterinarian, you know that my cow actually is fertile. So you come up to me and say, hey, you know, if your cow was fertile, I'd pay you $30,000, but you're telling me that your cow is sterile. So I'm only going to give you $2,000 for her. Um, in that case, I'm making a mistake. I think I'm selling you a sterile cow, but you knew the truth of the matter. So that's borderline unethical, right? Um, well, I could go to court and I could say, look, Your Honor, I was mistaken. I thought I was selling a cow that was sterile. In fact, she was fertile and I got swindled out of some money. Um, a mistake in transmission is where you're using an interpreter or a third party to um, uh, negotiate terms. So if I'm speaking, you know, if I'm dealing with you and you're Japanese and we're using an interpreter who, um, and, you know, I say $15,000 and the interpreter says $50,000, well, that's a really big difference. But I can't tell that's happening because I don't speak Japanese. You can't tell it's happening because you don't speak English. It was, a, and we find out later that, in fact, it was a mistake in the transmission of the terms. A mistake in value, again, this is a lot like that cow. I thought it was only worth 2000 and it was worth 30000 Sometimes a mistake in value, if it was... Um, you know, if it's not too far off, is acceptable. But if it's really, really far off, then, you know, we can go to court and we can try to hash that out. Illegality, of course, if the contract is based on something that is illegal, then it is not a contract at all. Um, unconscionability. This is where uh, you enter into a contract and it's just really unfair for one side. Um, some The classic forms of unconscionability. The first, first one is hidden risk shifting provisions. This is that ultra little tiny fine print that's written in such a way that a normal person doesn't understand what it's saying. And you go ahead and sign it because you don't want to spend an hour and a half reading this contract before you buy your TV or whatever it is that you're buying. Um, so you just sign away. Um, there may be some hidden risk shifting positions, provisions in there that sort of take away all the risk from one party and place it all on the other. And that is not, um, sometimes that is not considered fair. An adhesion contract is a contract that's actually used quite often, especially with um, leases where, you know, the landlord has all the power and the authority and you can't rent this apartment unless you sign this lease. I mean, you really don't have a choice. If you want that apartment, you're going to sign that lease, right? 
Um, adhesion contracts are usually found to be okay. However, there are some adhesion contracts that are so egregious and they are unconscionable. Um, for example, if you are one day late paying your rent, which is $350 a month, your late fee is $1,000 a day. Now that's just ridiculous and the court is not going to enforce that as being unconscionable. Another way that you can say, look, I know I entered into this contract, but your honor, you can't enforce it against me because I have a statute of frauds defense. The statute of frauds says that certain types of contracts must be in writing and they are those six listed there. Um, they must be in writing. And if they're not in writing, then no contract was formed. So if you had an oral contract regarding any of these things, if you go into court, all you have to do is bring up the statute of frauds defense and say, Your Honor, we, we didn't have a contract at all. Um, and that would be in the case of, you know, naming an executor or administrator. Um, if you agree to pay the debts of another, um, a prenuptial agreement has to be in writing. Anything done in consideration of marriage, any interest in real estate, real property, interest in land. Um, if you cannot uh, perform the contract, the service contract within one year, it must be in writing. Um, also, like if it's a lease or something like that, if it's going to be for a year or more, it has to be in writing. Um, and any um, goods, movable goods, personal property that is... Uh, Priced at $500 or more, that also needs to be in writing. Um, also, that executor or the administrator, um, I want to clarify, um, that's if the executor or the administrator um, would have to pay for anything, the debts of the estate, from their own money. That would definitely have to be in writing. Um, anything else that the um, executor um, or administer, administrator. You want to make sure those things are in writing, but that specifically is something that would have to be in writing. Um, so that kind of takes care of all of the defenses. What if you have these people on the outside of the contract? That Say there's a contract between you and me. What if we bring a third party into this situation? Um, how are they affected? What rights do they have? And in what situation might that come up? Um, well, a third party beneficiary that is a person who is intended to receive the benefits of a contract created by someone else. So maybe you and I enter into an agreement and I say, look, I'll sell you my house, but I need you to give the money to my daughter or pay for my daughter's college education. My daughter in that case, you and I are entering into the agreement. Okay, I'm giving you my house. It's not my daughter's house. I'm giving you my house. It's the way you're paying for it is you're paying for my daughter's education. So she's actually going to be the beneficiary to that contract. Um, also, somebody that could be um, a third party to a contract is somebody that you assign your rights to. Say, I have a contract to fill up all the vending machines in my town. I put all the soda in there, I put all the chips, and I get a certain amount of money for going around all of the stores and everywhere where there's a vending machine. I get a certain amount of money for that. Well, let's say I don't feel like doing that anymore. I can assign my rights in that contract over to somebody else who's going to perform those duties for me. Okay, um, so those are things that I could assign to another person. Um, and, you know, that's a good benefit for that other person. It kind of gets me out of what I was doing. So what are some things that you cannot assign? Um, well, if the obliger's duty has changed or if the risk has changed, um, you know, instead of filling up uh, uh, vending machines, what if I changed it to some other thing like you have to go, um, now you have to stock bait at stores, who wants to stock worms and minnows, okay? That doesn't sound like a very fun job. That's not, that's not what we signed up for. Um, assignment is prohibited by law. Sometimes the law says you can't assign these types of contracts. And, and an assignment prohibited by uh, contractual provisions, a lot of times in your lease, um, it will say you cannot assign your rights under these lease to somebody else without the permission of the landlord. Um... Assignments um, of the following types have to be in writing. A lot of them can be verbal, but these types must be in writing. Any kind of wages that you might receive um, due to um, the assignment or wages that you're due to pay. Um, any kind of interest in land, again, real, real property 
Um, that always has to be in writing. Anytime you're selling something for more than $500 and any kind of security interest that, you, that someone might have under UCC Article 9. All of those things have to be in writing. So how are the duties assigned um, when you have, how are the duties delegated? I'm going to use the correct terminology. When you have an assignment. Um, well, those obligations um, or duties, they are not assigned, they are delegated. So duties that are subject to delegated are those requiring um, judgment or skill, anything involving a trust relationship, anything that would change the expectancy of the obligee, and those covered by a contract provision that restricts or prohibits delegation. Um, so anything can be um, delegated from the person who was originally in, in the contract to the new person. Um, there are no special rules or formalities about how you would do that. And here's the liability. Okay, so originally I was in that contract to deliver all of those goods to the vending machines. Well, I assigned um, my contract interest and rights over to somebody else and delegated the duties to go fill up those vending machines um, to Fred. We'll just call him Fred. Um, the vending machine company that I have the um, contract with, they have to accept Fred's performance. Okay, I delegated him. They have to accept his performance if there isn't a contract provision that says I wasn't allowed to do that. Um, now, me personally, I remain liable on the contract even though I have Fred doing it. Okay, I can, I can get in trouble if Fred isn't doing his job. Okay, um, and Fred can also be sued by the vending machine company and he can also be sued by me if he's not what he's supposed not doing what he's supposed to do okay so the first part of the slideshow we covered all the defenses to contracts and then we kind of delved into this all right um non-parties there's somebody who's not really a part of the original contract i mean what's up with them so that's what we just covered now we're going to be moving on to interpreting the contract um, when does a court sort of look at a contract and say, all right, we really need to read the terms and provisions here? Well, when they're reading the terms and provisions, exactly how are they doing that? What, what type of... Well, there's something called the uh, peril evidence rule that says that if it's in writing, you can't change those terms by this outside evidence. Anything that's written or oral evidence... Like, for example, um, when you're signing a lease with your landlord and it specifically says in the lease, no pets, but the landlord wink winks at you and shakes your hand and says, sure, you can have a dog. Um, but then later on tries to evict you because you had a dog. You can't go to court and say, your honor, he told me I could have a dog. And because the judge is going to say it says specifically in the contract, it says it in the lease that you're not allowed to have dogs. That outside evidence, that wink, wink, sure you can have a dog, is oral evidence that is outside the written contract, and ordinarily that is not going to be accepted in court as evidence. Here are some exceptions um, to the peril evidence rule. If the contract itself, if you're saying that the contract is not valid, then you can have outside evidence come in. To clarify an ambiguity, if there's something in the contract that doesn't make sense, it's really, it's worded kind of funny or it can have two different meanings, the court really needs to look at that. To refute consideration, this is where you're saying, look, consideration was not paid, okay? I'm not getting a bargain for exchange here. Okay, any kind of subsequent modification. If after you've entered into the contract, later on you have a discussion about maybe having a pet at your department apartment, and the and the landlord says, "Sure, you can pay an extra fifty dollars a month. I'll let you have the dog." Um, you can bring in evidence to that effect um, to show that perhaps there was a subsequent modification. Not saying you're going to win, but you might be able to say. Your Honor, I think this can come in. It's an exception to the peril evidence rule. And then a U the UCC says that a party may not contradict the written document at all, but you can add consistent additional terms. Remember, the UCC is the Uniform Commercial Code, and that's specifically dealing between merchants. Well, that's all I have for this lecture. I hope you learned something. If you have any questions, as always, don't hesitate to contact me. Have a good day.